including now, as opposed to what the Israeli Supreme Court decided almost 20 years ago, including now the beginning again of, of confiscation of Palestinian private land. It's not just settlements on so-called state land, but it's confiscating or legalizing the seizure of private land for settlements, which eat up the very territory about which Israeli leaders say they want to negotiate. Second, Israeli leaders say that there's a new precondition, which is acceptance of Israel as a Jewish state. <clears throat> now, all societies have the right to define their own cultural, ethnic, political characteristics. But it's really unheard of in international relations to expect another country to recognize the characteristics of a society as opposed to recognizing the giving diplomatic recognition. So you have these activities by Israel and this precondition which have taken it off in a different direction. And finally, you have the United States. The United States, over the course of the past three years, under the presidency of Barack Obama, has tried four tactical approaches to instigating or invigorating the peace process. First was the idea of a settlements freeze, which, as nice as it would have been to achieve, was not ever in the realm of possible achievement as a precondition for negotiations. Now, for those of you who want to Google what I have written since I've left government, I have focused a great deal of attention on settlements policies. I am not a supporter of settlements. But to expect that Israel is going to stop settlement activity, including natural growth and advanced negotiations, is not realistic. Second, the idea of proximity talks. Palestinians reportedly did bring substance to proximity talks. Israel did not. Third, direct negotiations. They lasted three weeks. And then the president on May 13th suggested a trade-off in negotiations of borders and security. And as soon as Israel pushed back, the president started walking away. And then the Palestinians continued pushing back by insisting upon the preconditions which were not going to be achieved. So you've got three parties that are heading in totally opposite directions. The question now for the United States and for the two parties themselves is how do you realign the strategic interests and purposes so that all three sides are moving in one direction towards the achievement of a peace settlement? Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Kurtzer. Now we move to our next uh, speaker, Mr. Uraikat. I will not introduce him as a uh, chief negotiator because this may imply he's unemployed. So I will introduce him as the PLO executive committee member. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Number one, the US borders in the 21st century are no longer with Canada and Mexico and the two oceans. The U.S. is a country with 200,000 kids in Iraq and Afghanistan, and the geographic borders of the United States today are with Iran, Turkey, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, China, Pakistan, the Gulf, Saudi, Syria, and Jordan. And when the geopolitics of superpowers change, this reflects the functional role of nations in the region. So I don't think President Bush, who by the way was the first American president to acknowledge the Palestinian state and to call it Palestine, he did not wake up one morning and felt his conscience was aching for my suffering that he said that, that the Palestinian state is a national American interest. And I believe that the US has exerted and continue to exert every possible effort in order to achieve a Palestinian state to serve their interest, as much as I did not wake up one morning and felt my conscience aching for the suffering of Israelis that I sit with them. It's a need for me. It's a matrix of interest that is developing. We're watching it very carefully. And I will challenge the Arabs with one question. I went to the UN 
submitted an application in the Security Council for the State of Palestine as a peace-loving country that commits to all the Charter of the UN, international law, the rule of law, to live side by side the State of Israel in peace and security in 67. For this crime that we got membership in UNESCO, now the American Congress decided to cut the aid for us. There were consequences. Israel withheld back my money. They stole our money. Since we're under occupation, everything we buy, import from outside, the taxes, revenues are collected by Israel for a 3% surcharge. Now they took it. What were the consequences on America from Morocco to Oman for taking such a position? Zero. And as long as Arabs fail to speak with the United States and Western Europe with the language of interests, we will continue as Arabs to be affected without any impact on the making of American foreign policy. We're cost free. America has the fifth fleet in Arab territories, CENTCOM in Arab territories, the short and medium term missiles in a Muslim country, the logistical supplies in, Eastern, in Western Asia and Central Asia, Arab and Muslim countries. And yet, all of this, when it comes to trying to understand the language of interest, no one even the relationship between you and your wife, you and your teacher, you and your colleagues. Everything is about a matrix of interest that we have to watch carefully on the hour, every hour, to see how the needs are developing. Failure of Arab policy makers to speak to the Americans with the language of interests and understanding of the Americans of the pity needs of Arab regimes have led to the non-solution of this conflict. I don't accept that Jews are against peace. I have met with my president, the leaderships of the Jewish community in the United States, and I've hardly heard an avoid, a single voice of them saying no to the two-state solution, or no to the state of Palestine in 67. We should not hide behind this. We should learn how to speak with the language of interest. Failure to speak with the language of interests will marginalize us as Arabs further and further and further. That's number one. Number two, when we went to the UN as Palestinians, by the way, going to the UN is not our strategy. Going to the UN is part of our strategy. When we submitted the application to the Security Council, did we know that the Americans will use a veto if needs to? Yes, they told us. Well, did we know that they will exert every possible pressure on countries, members of the Security Council, like Bosnia, Colombia, Portugal, whoever, to abstain so we don't have the nine votes? We knew that. Why, did we, why, why are we doing this? We're doing this 20 years later, after the beginning of the peace process, and failure to achieve the end game of two states, we're trying to achieve three things at the UN. <clears throat> Number one, we're telling the Americans our right to self-determination will not be in the hands of my Israeli occupier. George Washington did not keep that right in the hands of George III, and no one did, and we will not do. Number two, we are trying to restore credibility to international relations. And number three, we are trying to restore morality to international relations. Those who speak of real politik and those who come from the schools of real politik should not mix between nation states guided by the Charter of the UN principles, advancements of man, democracy, human rights, and the language of blackmail, thuggery, and mafia style. Realpolitik does not mean to deprive international relations out of its morality, and as Palestinians, we are doing that. We went to UNESCO just to show the extent of morality 
and those who are restoring international credibility to international law and international politics, that they are rewarded. We got 107 votes. A people with no country, no borders, no economy, no armies, no navy. And if it's my word against anyone, any Israeli in the Congress and the Senate, I'm dead. I don't stand a chance. I, who said life is about fairness and justice? And yet, 107 nations voted for us, and 15 nations stood with the Americans and the Israelis. 85% of the international community voted for the morality, international law, and the rights of determination. And this lesson should be learned by American policymakers because if they think that the current policies are sustainable, they are committing the most strategic mistake in, in, in the 21st century. I said this morning that we as Arabs are reshaping and the U.S. must reshape. Our strategy is to restore Palestine back to the geographic map. We have recognized the state of Israel to live in peace and security in six, seven lines. And this recognition stands. We exchange letters. The Arabs have passed the Arab Peace Initiative, in which they said once Israel withdraws to the 67 borders, all Arabs will have relations with the state of Israel. And yet, till this moment, we don't have a partner in this Israeli government. And that's the truth. And I could care less if someone is pro-Palestine, pro-Israel, my world is divided between those who are pro-peace and those who are against peace. That's the truth at the end of the day. Israel is a country with 5,000 tanks, 3,000 fighting planes, nuclear weapons. I am the most disadvantaged negotiator in history of man. I have no country, no navy, no air force, no economy. My people are fragmented. But having said all of that, Israel has three options and three options only. Number one, my option, two states on 67. And we have come a long way on this, agreeing to swaps, Jerusalem being capital of two states, just an agreed to social refugees, uh, arrangements for security. And this government did not even open the door to see who, what's coming to it. We tried to give them papers on all these issues. They refused to take it front of American officials like Madam McClinton was sitting in one of the meetings whereby Netanyahu refused to take the papers from Abu Mazen. Number two option, if they continue with settlements and dictation rather than peace and negotiations, is a one-state solution. From my hometown Jericho to the Tel Aviv in the Mediterranean, it's 87 kilometers. This will not change. And this doesn't scare me. You want to call the West Bank Judea and Samaria? You want to call my hometown Jericho Yericho? You want to call Jerusalem Yerushalayim? You want to call me Mar Erekat instead of Mr. Erekat? Speak to me. Once I say this, oh, you evil, evil Palestinians, you want to undermine the Jewish nature of Israel. What do you want from me? I'm offering two states, you're saying no. I'm offering one state, I become evil. The third option Israel is practicing today in the West Bank is upper side. And hear me very carefully, hear me well. Such diseases as bigotry and racism, once it inflicts underneath our skin, we tend to justify it, sometimes sociologically, economically, sexually, racially. And today there are roads in the West Bank in 2011, November. Christians and Muslims cannot use. There are buses that run in the streets of my West Bank that Palestinians cannot ride. Never in the darkest hours of South Africa's apartheid were blacks prevented to use buses whites were using. Yes, they see them in the front, I think, in the end. And such diseases no one is immune to. And today Israel is explaining the development of this apartheid system by the concept called Security. Can you conclude? Thanks. I'm going to say the last sentence. The last sentence is that there is no more important 
thing on our agenda than reconciliation. Hamas is a Palestinian political party that won the elections. We're talking. And when Israel will sign peace with us, every political party in Palestine must commit to the two-state solution, must accept agreement signed. That's what we're doing. But no, nothing should stop in the path of our reconciliation. If Mr. Netanyahu, before we began the reconciliation, was saying one sentence, who shall I make peace with? The West Bank or Gaza? These people are divided. Now when we make reconciliation, how can I make peace with them? They're reconciling with him. So there is a difference between a negotiator and a non-negotiator. Netanyahu is a non-negotiator. And he wants to maintain the status quo. And we're telling him, you will not, you cannot. If you think you can maintain the status quo, if you think you can deprive the authority from its jurisdiction in the domains of security, geography, politics, whatever, and maintain yourself as a source of authority, think again. I am not advocating the dissolution of the Palestinian Authority. All I'm saying, Palestinian Authority was born in a contract with Israel to deliver Palestinians from occupation to independence. That's its main function. If Netanyahu thinks that he can change the function of the Palestinian Authority, he may soon find himself the only authority between the River Jordan and the Mediterranean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Araika. Now we uh, move on to our next speaker, Octavia Nasser, a prominent uh, journalist, uh, well known for her work at CNN, and now she's a columnist at the Nahar newspapers. Octavia, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to start by reminding everyone that on this day last year, Tunisia had a president, and his name was Zain al Abidin bin Ali. And Egypt had a president, and his name was Husni Mubarak. And Libya had a leader, and his name was Muammar Gaddafi. And all these men were either allies or friends, or perfectly fine with the United States of America. I remind you of this because today there is a race to see who will say it louder that Husni Mubarak was a dictator or that Muammar Gaddafi was a terrorist against his own people. Who's hanging in the balance today is Assad in Syria. Well, I'd like to remind everyone that when the uprising started in Syria back in March, the US had just sent its ambassador to Syria after an absence of about six years. So the relations were just starting to warm up, were just starting to get better when the uprising began in Syria. I remind you of all this because I have a feeling somehow that people forget, and the media play a very important role in helping people forget. And the changes that were brought on the ground in all these countries, and of course we still have to know what's gonna happen in Yemen, what's gonna happen in Bahrain, what's gonna happen in Syria, we don't know who's going to be in power when we meet again next year. And no one is immune, as we've seen on the ground. No one, no country, no leader is immune of this fever that's sweeping the entire Middle East. And with all the might of the United States, people were able to bring down governments. People were able to bring down aides and supporters and friends and allies of the mighty United States of America. They didn't need armies. They didn't need weapons. All they needed were their voices, their bodies, taken to the streets, day in, day out, repeating with the loudest voices they've got, down with the leadership. And guess what? It worked. I know there are challenges ahead, but all I want you to think about is that it worked. I've been writing about these uprisings all, all year, of course. And when I talk about the Arab leadership, I have to say that in my writings, I came to describe the Palestinian leadership as the one that brought revolution for its own people. 
instead of the people, the Palestinian people revolting against their leadership, it's the leadership that took the lead and brought the revolution onto their own people. And I'm glad that Saib is on this panel, and I'm glad he spoke the way he did, because that's exactly what is bringing change these days. It's not sitting down, listening to ourselves talk, enjoying, you know, two minutes and five minutes and 10 minutes and an hour of me, 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 me speak. It's being silent for a change and listening to people and seeing what they have to say. Because these people deal with other people at the same level. They don't sit there and complain or put the blame on Israel, on the United States, on Iran, on the West. We can put the blame on anybody, anytime. That's not a problem. That's easy to do. We can play victims all the time, easy, no problem. We can all do that. But to bring change takes action, and it takes courage, and it takes transparency. It takes someone to know exactly where they're standing and to know exactly what they want and stand in the face of the other and say, you want to live in peace? You, you want to coexist? This is how we can coexist. And then take it from there. So I want to remind everyone as we open this discussion that nonviolence was the key for the Middle East when we talk about relations between Arabs and the United States. And I speak as someone who's both Arab and American equally. I cannot divide, I cannot take myself and say, okay, this part of me is American, this part of me is Arab. And I can promise you, they're the same. They're people, they're humans. And when you deal with them, you have to deal with them at that level and then get them to listen. And they will listen. Thank you. Thank you, Octavia. Now we move on to our next speaker, Mark Allen Bogan. If I could use some uh, Arab terminology to, do, to describe your uh, position right now, he's a member of the American ruling party, the Democratic Party. But uh, <laughs> one difference, when they lose the election, they evacuate the White House. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, first, I just need to say that I'm not speaking on behalf of the party. That needs to be clear because I'll be quite strident. And there are a lot of things that have already been said here that uh, I will respond to. I'll spend a minute talking about some of my background, and then I'll spend a minute commenting on some of the things said here, and then I hope we'll have an opportunity to have questions posed to us. Uh, commenting on the other speakers to the uh, Q&A sessions, but now we would like to hear your own presentation, and let's defer the uh, rebattling what our uh, panelists said before. Well, part Please. of being in a panel is to rebut what people have said, and I'll use my time as I choose with all due respect. Um, the fact is that my experience has mostly been in Central and Eastern Europe, and we were part of a group that fought the communists during the 70s, and I was one of the people who helped carry out the articles of Václav Havel and Tadeusz Mazowiecki and Apad Gunch and so on. Um, I then later joined the U.S. military, having gone to the academy, and later got involved in public life. In 2000, I was in an outside group helping uh, Al Gore, and in 2004, in a more direct way, I was a senior foreign policy advisor for Wesley Clark's campaign for president. When I first got to your forum in 2008, 2009, I had been nominated for a position. And like many people in my position who had been big donors to the party and had a public policy background, my nomination got held up and after about 13 months I said I don't hate myself enough to continue going through this process. Um, my voice in the Democratic Party is a more conservative voice and it's not always well liked, but I do respect people like Howard Dean and others who decided that people like me should get involved. Having said that, you know, we spent a lot of time today talking about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, and I've known Saeed for a long time, although I do, as you know, not like it when you talk about apartheid, although I generally agree with many of the things that you say, and we've had this discussion before. I also completely reject when people talk about a Zionist lobby. I find it offensive and racist, and frankly, as a person who was born and raised in Germany, I think you need to be very, very careful, dear sir, how you use that terminology. Uh, third. This panel is supposed to be about the U.S. and our relationship with the Arab world, and it's not clear that our relationship has gotten better from Bush to Obama. And I think that there are different reasons for that. Different mistakes have been made by both presidents, unfortunately. Um, part of it is stridency in the case of President Bush, the way he saw the world. I don't know how he added two plus two and came up with 10, 
but he did make decisions for better or worse. And I do think that you have to remember that Saeed did say he was the first president of the United States. It wasn't a Democratic president. It was a Republican president who recognized a Palestinian state and called it as such. So I think when we have these discussions, it's a little bit unfair to break it all down into Republican presidents have this feeling and Democrats have the other. It's much more confusing than that. Um, I think our relationship with the Arab world at the moment is not very good. I think that we've made a lot of mistakes along the way. The ambassador mm -hmm. talked about it a little bit in a more diplomatic way than I have to, thankfully. Um, I'm not bound by that. But nonetheless, I also don't want to be offensive. And also, I think mixing and matching the Arab world is a very bad thing. You can't just say the Arab world. You have to look at regions. You have to look at states. North Africa is different than the Gulf states, is different than Egypt, is different than Palestine. Is different. There are lots of complications. And the other thing that I completely reject is this concept that the Palestinian and the Israeli conflict is the beginning and an end all of all conflicts in the Arab world. And Saeed talked thoughtfully about that. The fact is the Israelis and Palestinians will make peace long before the Arab world has solved all its problems. And those are my comments, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights.